Welcome to the Flying Focus 23rd Busiversary. I'm PC Perry, a founding member of the Flying Focus Video Collective. We've been producing video as a tool for social change since 1991. Our hundreds of programs have covered activists, speakers, visionaries, forums, street protests, and other hard-to-find information. And I'm Barb Green. I've been with Flying Focus since 1995. Flying Focus brings you information that you don't see in the corporate media. Peace, animal rights, economic, environmental, and social justice, all are topics you might see on our weekly program. The half-hour Flying Focus video bus premiered November 18, 1991. This show marks 23 years since we started. Tonight, some of our volunteer producers and videographers will talk about the 14 shows, made up of 24 episodes, that we produced between November 2013 and October 2014. We'll be presenting clips from these programs and hear what the producers have to say about the shows. TV can be a vast wasteland. It can be more than that. Join us and learn how to do it with us. Grab a pen and paper, write this down. If you want to get involved, call us at 503-239-7456 or 503-321-5051 or write us at ffvc at flyingfocus.org. We air our program on cable access, but you can also see short clips and many of our shows and some full episodes streaming on the web at flyingfocus.org. Barb Green is here, and I know you saw her before, but she did six episodes this year, uh, one of which was on brownfields. Yes. What was that like? Well, this was um, a panel that you videotaped. Oh, right. Talking about um, how to take a brownfield or a contaminated site and what the steps are that you have to go through to turn it into um, something that can be used either as a business or a garden or something like that. So not an eyesore and be productive and the soil usable. Exactly, Good. yeah. Um, did you illustrate some of the uh, sites? I went, I went out and um, taped some of the uh, sites that have been turned into productive sites. I think the uh, community much appreciated the uh, change of appearance. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So in this clip that we're going to see, um, a couple of the people on the panel are talking about the benefits of uh, transforming those properties. I'm sure everybody here knows somebody in their life that is either underemployed or unemployed in the city of Portland, right? These 910 acres right here, you redevelop these 910 acres, that's 31,000 jobs. 31,000 jobs. Um, that's a significant amount of job growth, economic development in our city on nothing on these sites where nothing is happening right now. Um, the other piece of it, too, is that it generates property tax revenue. Um, from those jobs, you generate payroll tax revenue. Um, $42 million a year, it's this sort of theoretical 100% brownfield redevelopment of this inventory right here, that's how much the city of Portland would make in tax revenue, $42 million a year. It would only cost $214 million to clean everything up. One time. One time. So that means if we cleaned everything up, and had a, this perfect ideal market where you could develop all these sites and there's a market for 100% development, you could have every, everything paid off in five years. So there's a huge economic benefit to that. And then we talk about the benefit to our communities. Uh, you locate 31,000 jobs on here, that means 31,000 people don't have to get into their cars and travel the average commute time in the Portland region of 61 minutes. But in terms of general benefit, I mean, it's all benefits. It's, there's environmental, this is contamination, it's in the soil. It's potentially affecting people's health. It's potentially contaminating uh, surface water and groundwater, and <laughs> it's a site the that's air. not contributing, and the air, it's a site that's not contributing anything economically, it's not contributing anything to the character of a neighborhood, it's a site where there are no taxes potentially being paid. It's, it's like win-win all around to work on brownfields. Um, and I, I also want to point out that they're usually sites that are just <laughs> filled with opportunity. I mean, if it's a brown field, it got contaminated sometime in the past. It got contaminated because something was happening on that site. And something was probably happening on that site because that site had some advantages. That site was well located or it had great access or it was around where people lived or worked or it was a great big size or it had, you know, 
there's a reason why something used to happen there, and probably that reason still exists. So all of those opportunities you can still tap into again if you can deal with this barrier. This is a uh, coverage that we did at uh, Jefferson High School, um, race talks, and this is the Latino version of the race talks. There were others, but this is the Latino version. Right. This, um, this one had uh, three people um, who are all in the school, working in the school system, mm -hmm. talking about their experiences growing up and today um, here in supposedly liberal Portland and their experiences with racism, um, which is really pretty shocking. Two Latino, one Latina, and uh, an eye-opener. Exactly, very much so. Let's take a look. I grew up hating everything about myself. I hated my name, I hated who I was, I hated my parents, and I start hanging around with people that were not good influences for me. And I was washing dishes. And I ended up dating a waitress. And the waitress um, she was a mixed race, half white, half um, um, Thai, from Thailand. She said to me one time, what are you doing? I mean, I was going to City College and taking a class here and a class there. You're smart. You need to go to the university. I said, I can't. Look, my grades, I don't have my grades. I can barely make it financially. She went and talked to the president of Fresno State University. So I remember taking a class that turned me around, and it was Chicano Latino Studies. When you study about who you are, where you came from, when you start studying about um, Corky Gonzalez, when you start talking about Cesar Chavez, about the leaders of the Latino movement, in the history of my people. That's when I came around. But I was in my mid-twenties when I started to turn things around. And I say this because this is what I see in a lot of our kids, being lost in the system. And when I say the practices, is not that somebody comes to us is the system does not have a way to design success for kids like me. This year I covered Curtis Acosta, Mexican-American uh, teacher, uh, administrator in the Tucson area. Um, yes, he's a, an award-winning um, educator um, he taught Mexican American studies and was incredibly successful. He, his program and he was covered by the New York Times, the LA Times, he was on The Daily Show. Mm. Um, the kids that he taught had a much higher rate of attending college, a much mm. lower dropout rate. And then the state of Arizona and the school district cut his program entirely. Um, and so he talks a little bit about his program here. This one we don't focus upon enough. Being a great human being. You know, positive self-identity, purpose, hope, critical socio-historical identity, barrio organic intellectualism, right? All these things. These are all collaborative too, you know? This wasn't a me thing, this was a us thing. This is me and my homies. And that's super important too. And with this as our our context, our, our, not context, but our goal, this was our goal, this was our goal, this stuff came. You know, if this is your goal, that stuff don't come. And this stuff happened too. And, 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 and we could put squash beef and, you know, lots of fun. Oh, I know, lots of fun over there, but squash beef. and Because we did, like you saw, like, 
gang, whatever that is, neighborhoods, barrios that have like always like had some beef, and that tension at our school is like chill. And there's a part in the Devil's Highway where Luis Alberto Urrea says, "Please, not no, not a not a Chicano migra." He says Mexican American. He does that on purpose, Luis. Luis self-identifies as Chicano, so you know what he's saying right there. If you don't, then we could talk later. But <laughs> he goes like Mexicanos are like you know folks work like folks crossing. That's better. Immigrants crossing like they see the migra. That's that's you know them, right? Mexican American. No, no, I don't want any of that. You know, it reminds me, those, I'm of a certain vintage, N.W.A. Please don't let it be a black and a white one. Black police showing off for the white cop. That internalized oppression going to get you killed with a T. You know, and, and that's what happens. When you don't love who you are, you want to take it out on the mirror. And the mirror is homie down the street rocking the different shade of whatever, or whatever it is, Right? But when, when, you, when you love yourself, you're free from that. If you want to have, like, see a, a wonderful account of that, you should read Always Running by Luis uh, Rodriguez. Hi again. I'm PC Perry, and I acted as field coordinator for Flying Focus. I was involved in taping or coaching videographers for 13 of this year's 14 shows. And I produced two of this year's shows. The first one features Stan Karp, who is with the Rethinking Schools Project. He spoke in Portland in 2013 about the problems with the Common Core curriculum, being pushed by corporations like Microsoft into our schools at the cost of our public education. He also talked about parents who are organizing to opt their children out of this testing scheme. In these clips, you will hear him outline the reasons that progressive teachers oppose Common Core as differentiated from more conservative reactions. The main trouble with the Common Core is not what's in these standards of what's been left out, although that's certainly an issue. But the bigger problem with the Common Core is the role that it's been playing in the larger dynamics of current school reform and education policy. The trouble with the Common Core standards includes the process by which they were created and adopted, the tests that are coming with them, the resource implications, the overhyped claims for what Common Core is going to be able to accomplish, the hurried and disruptive implementation timelines, the history of Common Core's origins as the fix for NCLB, and the problems that come with all standardization, uh, the problems of standardization rather, that come with all standards proposals. Now you'll notice that I didn't mention the Tea Party's objection, that Obama Core is an unconstitutional plot to indoctrinate American students to accept the left-wing view of America and its history. <laughs> or, that was still a chapel, actually. Or that it's the federal school curriculum of terrorist professor Bill Ayers. <laughs> My friend Ken Libby, who I think some of you know, has been cataloging the most off-the-wall claims of the growing right-wing opposition to Common Core. Uh, I think his favorite, uh, what he calls core spiracy. His favorite is the fear that Common Core seeks to kill cursive handwriting so that future citizens will not be able to read the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Everything that happens in education policy is affected by what is in effect an attempt to privatize an annual a sector that's about a $600 billion annual expenditure that after having you know, to do to education what the market has done to health care, to housing, to, uh, un to the job market, and that's to produce fabulous opportunities for a few and unequal access for the many. Yeah. This is a fight over saving democracy and public space. Yeah. And if we don't make it that big, we are not going to be able to save the particular institution that we're fighting for today. Next, we'll see a clip from a show featuring peace activist and author David Swanson. He spoke in the now defunct Laughing Horse bookstore late in 2013 about the history of efforts to make war illegal. In this clip, he talks about a law that was passed in the United States between the First and Second World War to outlaw warfare. I was glad to have a chance to record this event because it's not widely known and more people need to benefit from this precedent. And it's not just a handful of activists who want to end war. 
hundred years ago, it was just about everybody. In 1926, there was a movement created in this country to criminalize war. And imagine if at that date you had this understanding of nonviolent alternatives to war. You had this understanding that war wasn't needed and you wanted to get it across to the, to the country and the government and the world. Uh, well, these people created a, a movement, and this is what this book, uh, When the World Outlawed War, is about, to criminalize war because up through World War I, war was perfectly legal. There was no, it, was, it was sort of outside of law. It wasn't legal or illegal. It was like the weather. It just came along, and, and certain tactics were illegal. The, the, the understanding that human rights groups have now uh, in certain parts of the world, that was the universally the understanding and really the actual law on the books at that time. It, you know, territory seized through war was your territory. You seized it through war. Well, they decided to ban war to make it illegal, to outlaw it. They had an outlawry movement uh, and organized in this country and around the world with the idea of moving beyond war as a barbaric practice not to be tolerated, which included defensive war, included humanitarian war, included philanthropic war and NATO approved and UN authorized war and every other species of war there could be uh, in the decades to come. And they did it. And they put a law on the books, uh, a treaty, with most of the big nations of the world. Uh, and this was the biggest story of 1928. This is not, you know, CIA history that's been uncovered. This has just been buried and not put in the history books. Uh, in 1928, the Kellogg-Briand Pact was created, which remains on the books to this day and makes every single war criminal. Uh, and they did it by organizing an incredibly broad peace movement uh, that included everybody and every institution and the League of Women Voters and the Rotary Club and the churches and the, uh, and the lawyers and the university professors and the bankers and you, know, you couldn't get more mainstream. Everybody wanted to get rid of war. Hi, I'm Dan Handelman, one of the founding members of Flying Focus. One person who couldn't join us tonight in the studio is Mike Brown. Mike has been working with Flying Focus since 2011 and was able to produce a two-part video bus with us this year. In August, PC taped a presentation by Portland area re resident Zahir Wahab, who has been traveling back and forth to his native Afghanistan since the U.S. invasion in 2001 to try to make things better for the people. I really appreciated that Mike was able to pull this show together. I was one of the organizers of the event, and while there was a decent-sized crowd, more people were able to hear Zahir's talk because of the show. Zahir talked about issues like the election, which recently replaced Hamid Karzai as president, but mostly he noted his efforts to create the American University in Kabul, including the serious security efforts that are needed in the still destabilized country. He also noted how the U.S. has more interest in Afghanistan than just an ongoing military presence. Uh, we have had six or seven lockdowns at the university. In lockdown meaning not just for an hour or a half an hour, but for a whole day or two days. At one point, we were all evacuated around election time, uh, June 15th or 16th. Uh, all of us Americans were evacuated to Dubai for 10 days. Um, no foreigner is safe in Afghanistan anywhere, especially if you're obviously Western-looking. And no one who works for the government, in particular if you are a high government official or are associated with the army or the intelligence or the police, you are not safe anywhere. Uh, after all these years, all the work, all the expenses, all the death and destruction, all the mayhem, etc., uh, there's no safety. Uh, there's no security, there's no law, there's no order, um, there's no peace of mind anywhere in the country. There, Afghanistan, unfortunately, it does have resources, and this could become a problem. This may be a problem, because the U.S. now, in addition to, say, the geopolitical strategic reasons for being there, and I can tell you this, the United States will never abandon Afghanistan. It's not leaving. Just like we never quite left Iraq or a lot of other places. You know, these 800, million, 800 bases all over the world. So the U.S. is not entirely leaving Afghanistan. It is working like crazy on nine different bases in the country. And the negotiation now is, will there be 15,000 or 20,000 or 10,000? But no one ever mentions that there are 100,000 contractors now in Afghanistan. 100,000 contractors off the books that 
And those contractors include Dyncor and Blackwater, which is now called something else. Um, so the contractors, for example, many of them are the ones who also load the drones and fly them, actually. Uh, but those are not counted as a military presence. So uh, the U.S. and its allies, uh, uh, if one can use that term, uh, they will never leave Afghanistan. This year I produced three shows, but I also provided editing assistance on all 14 shows. This was our first entire year using digital editing, which has expanded our abilities in some ways, but created other kinds of work we didn't have to do with linear editing. My first show is also on the topic of Afghanistan and from another event I helped organize. When the 12th anniversary of the invasion of Afghanistan rolled around in October 2013, Peace and Justice Works hosted a community forum that featured local activists interacting with several members of the Afghan peace volunteers. They were hooked up via an internet phone service from Kabul and talked about the political situation, the American occupation, and what it's like to promote peace in a war-torn land. You'll hear one of their voices and their adult mentor translating. Also in these clips are forum host Jenka Soderberg on getting active, Iraq War veteran Penny Dex on veteran suicides, and Code Pink's Trudy Cooper on American Empire. Uh, Emily Olson taped this and PC coached her. The 19 hijackers of September 11th, the supposed reason for the U.S presence in Afghanistan were all not from Afghanistan. Fifteen of the hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. Two were from the United Arab Emirates. One was from Egypt. And the last of the 19 was from Lebanon. None were from Afghanistan. We need to figure out how to protest the weapons manufacturers locally and nationally. We do have drone manufacturing facilities right there in Hood River and very close to us. So that's one thing to think about when we talk about what are some ways that we can organize here locally, connect with some of these groups and let's start this dialogue and challenge this war and move forward with actually uh, organizing a peace movement that can effectively shut down the war machine. When I started doing uh, Iraq Veterans Against the War work in 2011, it was 18 veterans kill themselves every day. As of the latest report, it's 22 veterans kill themselves every day. And I'm really curious how high that number has to get before people stop seeing this as business as usual. I don't know how many of you listened to Obama's speech to the General Assembly last week, the UN General Assembly last week, but he essentially denied that we were an empire and then he proceeded to lay out the conditions and demands of an empire and then he laid out the four uh, things that will justify or already have justified wars of aggression and one of them was any attack on an ally another was anything that might interrupt the flow of oil their oil by the way that does it for part one of the 23rd bus anniversary. I'm PC Perry of Flying Focus and I'm Dan Handelman uh, to get involved and or support Flying Focus you can call us at 503-239-7456 or check for showtimes at 503-321-5051. You can also write to us at ffvc at flyingfocus.org. Flying Focus is made up of volunteers and we're funded by donations and video orders. We always welcome more involvement, so write down our contact information and get in touch. Portland Community Media belongs to the community, and it keeps going thanks to regular people using it. We've seen PCM as our home for 23 years. Come make it yours. Thank you for watching and tune in next week at the same time for part two.
Nailed it. 